Philadelphia Warriors, the season's Cinderella team of big league basketball. Philadelphia 76ers, the champions of the world. The year was 1946 when the man known as the mogul Eddie Gottlieb created a new pro team at Philadelphia, the Warriors. When we uh, traveled, Eddie was not only the, the coach, he acted as a general manager, the traveling secretary, the trainer. And in those days we got $7.50 for meal money when you're on the road. Playing in the newly formed Basketball Association of America, the forerunner of the NBA, the Warriors were led by scoring sensation Joe Fawkes. He popularized that jump shot. Nobody saw that the way he shot it. Jumping Joe. <laughs> he was the great talent at that time. He was the Michael Jordan at that era. In 1947, Folks led the Warriors past the Chicago Stags to win the first BAA title, a rewarding experience for the team. We certainly felt good about it, and I think we felt good about it because we got $2,100 a man. That made us feel good in those days, that's for sure. Following in Falk's footsteps in the 1950s was a player who took the jump shot to the next level, Philly native pitching Paul Arizon. I had the ability to hang in the air. I would go up and they would go up with me and they would seem to come down, they said, and I would still be up there. In 1956, Arizon and the Warriors completed one of the NBA's most remarkable turnarounds. They came in last place in 1954-55 to the NBA championship the next year. With three-time scoring champion Neil Johnston manning the middle and local Philadelphia phenom Tom Gola starring in his rookie season, the Warriors returned to the top of the NBA, defeating the Fort Wayne Pistons in five games in the finals to capture their second league title. Philadelphia Warriors, the season's Cinderella team of big league basketball. Owner Eddie Gottlieb had chosen a Philadelphia high school legend in 1955 with a territorial draft pick. And four years later, the towering young man finally arrived. His name, Wilted Norman Chamberlain. Chamberlain was a giant. A great athlete, and he was a giant. He could do anything he wanted to do. He was such an overpowering physical figure that, that he could rule the game. People felt that Will was larger than the game because Will did things that were never done before he got here and I don't think they'll ever be done again. I think they had no way to compare what I was doing. It was so far out of the realm of believability that they had no way to compare. In 1962, Wilt averaged an astounding 50 points a game, including one unthinkable performance in Hershey, Pennsylvania. But despite his staggering individual achievements, Wilt's success would ultimately be measured by his battles with Boston's Bill Russell in the game's fiercest rivalry. You know, it was like two titans of the game meeting and you'd have headlines and Russell versus Chamberlain. They were the league. You know, I mean, people paid to see Russell and Chamberlain because that, that was the great challenge, the great duel. You have two giants. You know, there's the bad giant and there's a the good giant. I mean, always what was considered Goliath. Nobody wanted to face me singly. Nobody, Bill Russell or five Bill, Bill Russells. I never could stop him, but I could put some speed bumps. That's the best I could come up with. Wilt was a Paul Bunyan figure, a mythic in what he could personally do, but then every year he would get chopped down by Russell. Chamberlain's first three seasons ended in playoff disappointment. 
And when the franchise was sold in 1962, Wilt and the Warriors headed west to San Francisco, leaving Philadelphia without an NBA team for the first time in 16 years. Back in the 1950s, one of the Warriors' arch rivals had been the Syracuse Nationals, a tough team playing in a tough town. They took their team very seriously. I mean, you know, teams used to come in there, man, and, and fans would intimidate them. They hated to come there. The leader of the Nationals was their perennial all-star, Dolph Shays, one of the NBA's original Ironmen. He just had an, an, an immense amount of endurance and uh, a sensational touch. One way or another, he always beats you. It was Syracuse team owner Danny Biasone who conceived the idea of a 24-second shot clock, which saved the NBA and revolutionized the professional game. As it turned out, it also helped the Nats win the 1955 title. Watch Paul Seymour maneuver all the way. In the seventh game, we were 16 down at half and it looked like Fort Wayne really had our number. Over to Shays, whose one-hand marksmanship is terrific. Had not the 24-second clock been there, we never would have won. Kerr in the pivot. His jump shot is in there. And I thought, wow, this is terrific. My first year in the league, we won a world championship, and I said, this is going to be great. Syracuse proves unbeatable for Fort Wayne on his home court. Then a guy named Russell came in the league and a guy named Chamberlain came in the league and they happened to be in the same division that Syracuse was in and uh, we never made it out of the finals. Following the 1963 season, Biasone sold the franchise to two Philadelphians and the Nationals would be reborn as the 76ers. After a one-year absence, Philadelphia had a team again and soon after that, a trade brought Will Chamberlain back home too. But when it came to beating Boston, nothing had changed. Now Russell is... He loses the ball off the support. Russell lost the ball off the support. And the ball goes to Philadelphia. We're under their basket. We're trailing by one point. There's five seconds to go. Red Arbach had the cigar going. Now we see him reach over there and grind that cigar out. I devised a play <clears throat> where Greer takes it out of bounds, throws to Chet Walker. Greer is putting the ball on a play. He gets it out deep and Havlicek steals it. Over the stand, Jones. Havlicek stole the ball. It's all over. It's all over. And Havlicek steals the ball. I said, Havlicek, how lucky can you be? Jimmy Havlicek is being mobbed by the fans. Jimmy Havlicek stole the ball. It was like those kind of things that always prevented us from winning. And, and they said it was like this leprechaun. But Philadelphia's fortunes would change in the 1967 season with the arrival of the team's new head coach, Alex Hannum. I really didn't change anything. I, I just brought back the, uh, the, the feeling of the old Syracuse Nationals uh, with Wilt. You have a team that probably embodied what every professional team would like to have. There would have never been a power forward any more powerful than Luke Jackson with a touch, like a really very, very soft touch. And then Chet Walker, who was considered to be the best one-on-one -on -one player in the league, six, seven, and a half, six, six, eight, who no one could just guard on a one-on-one -on -one situation. And Hal Greer, who everyone knew as a premier metal distance shooter. And then we had a little guy named Billy Cunningham coming up the bench, and he was fearless. Meeting the mighty Celtics once again in the Eastern Conference Finals, the 76ers finally conquered their longtime nemesis in five games. They had ended Boston's run of eight straight championships and their own long run of frustration. The feeling of finally defeating this great team who had dominated the NBA for so many years was like an ultimate experience. In the NBA Finals, they would face Rick Barry and Philadelphia's former team, the San Francisco Warriors. The 76ers prevailed in six games to win the championship and stake their claim as one of the greatest teams in NBA history. I first thought about that as I remember after we won the World Championship was now I can walk in peace. And so I felt very strongly about now being able to have a summer vacation and not saying, wow, when y'all gonna beat those Celtics? 
but the euphoria wouldn't last. Moving into the spectrum the following season, the 76ers once again took a 3-1 lead over Boston in the conference finals. But with Billy Cunningham sidelined with a broken wrist, Philadelphia collapsed and suffered another bitter defeat to the Celtics. And by the next season, Wilta departed Philly once again, this time traded to Los Angeles. So our era of uh, the Will Chamberlain and the Sixers, where we thought we could have a dynasty for a while, had ended. By 1976, Philadelphia's title hopes were revived thanks to Julius Irving, who arrived from the ABA with a dazzling game and a fitting nickname. It wasn't Julius Irving, it was Dr. J, which meant when he got on the floor or on the court, he operated on guys. When Julius Irving started making his moves, they were moves that no one else could possibly make. He brought into vogue the idea of spending most of the game up in the air and never touching the ground. Just one dunk, and wherever you were, people were happy. They got to see the doctor perform. My game was probably a little bit ahead of its time. It probably was getting a glimpse of the game in the 90s and the 70s. While the doctor was the star attraction, he was joined by a cast of talented and colorful characters. They used to call us Dr. J in the traveling dunk show. People used to get mad when they missed our layup line before the game. This is warm up before the games. We're doing some crazy things. So the 76ers were really like this, this traveling circus of, of basketball at that time. They had Daryl Dawkins, you know, Dr. Duncan Stein. I had the rump roaster, the bun toaster, and in your face this grace. I always felt like that I was ahead of my time. I mean, we had so we just had too much fun, man. We did. I think we actually had so much fun until we forgot we had to play some nights. <laughs> in the 1977 finals, the Sixers were heavy favorites over the Portland Trailblazers in a matchup of teams that couldn't have been more different. The individualism, the showmanship of the 76ers, and the, and the quiet, reserved teamwork of, of the Portland Trailblazers. After racing to a two games to none lead on Portland, the 76ers began to lose momentum despite the heroic efforts of Julius Irving. Bill Walton, those guys, I know they were looking at him like, could you believe this? But Dr. J's aerial attack couldn't overcome the resilience of the Trailblazers, who swept four straight games and took the title. And after being eliminated the following season in the conference finals, the cast of the traveling dunk show began to change. As odd as that team was and as, as bad as the chemistry was, I think if it had stayed intact, the team, that team would have been successful because it was just so talented. The 80s got off to a promising start with a return trip to the finals and a highlight for the ages from the doctor. I didn't think the ball was going to go in. I, I thought that he was going to be stretched so far that you know, he was going to get it up there, but you know, it wasn't even close enough and not going in. It was just a beautiful shot and all you can do is just say, wow. But in the end, it was Magic Johnson and the Lakers who celebrated as champions, while the Sixers were left to endure the frustration of coming up empty once again. The next year in the 1981 Eastern Conference Finals, the curse of the Boston Celtics surfaced once more. This time, Philadelphia squandered a three games to one lead and lost to their arch rivals. The problem with Philadelphia really at that time was, we had so many stars, we didn't know who was gonna do what, what night. In the 82 Conference Finals, Philly was facing yet another monumental collapse as the Celtics came back to tie the series. And the Ghosts in Boston Garden were once again ready to bury the Sixers. But they would exercise their demons and silence the critics by winning Game 7 in Boston. Yet despite climbing a huge hurdle, they still couldn't reach the top of the mountain, losing once more to the Lakers in the Finals. I felt very helpless. I mean, I didn't feel like there was any more physically, mentally, emotionally that I could individually do. And it wasn't enough. But help was on the way for the 1983 season when the Sixers traded for one of the league's best centers, his name, Moses Malone. You know, I think we felt some pressure as far as, you know, well, we can't make it happen with this guy, you know, probably it's not going to happen. 
He just was relentless. Moses led the Sixers through the playoffs and into a finals rematch with L.A., who had beaten them two of the last three years. But this time, the story was headed for a different ending. After taking the first two games at home, the Sixers headed west with just one thing on their minds. We want to end it in four. We want someone to remember this team. And Philadelphia did end it in four, completing the sweep in Los Angeles. They had rolled through the postseason, winning 12 of their 13 games to finally capture the NBA title, their first in 16 years. One thing about this team that they should be remembered for is they had the ability every year to come back and just keep on doing it, and keep on doing it, and darn it, they climbed the mountain. Philadelphia 76ers, the champions of the world. The Sixers had brought the championship back to Philadelphia at long last, but the joy of winning would be short-lived. They would not return to the finals for the rest of Julius Irving's career, which ended in 1987 when the man who changed the game announced his retirement. Basketball is not just sport, but as ballet, as, a, as an American art form, begins with Julius Irving. He revitalized the NBA. His name is synonymous with basketball and class, Dr. J. Where does he rank and what kind of company? I don't know. Jesse Owens, Jackie Robinson, Joe DiMaggio, people like that. It's it for Julius Irving. Hello. I'm John Barkley. Here comes Charles. Down the lane. Goodbye. Here's Barkley now. Going to go in by himself. Gets the offensive rebound. Leading the Sixers into a new era was a bold, brash, and tremendously talented young star, Charles Barkley. I just got unique and different skills. I just was a 6'4 guy who was able to dribble the ball. I had quick leaping ability around the basket. Um, to have very quick feet. Uh, but I think the biggest asset of my game was the ability to dribble. Ellis Once it was showtime, once it was the time to start the game, uh, Charles was all business as far as playing the game, but he also had a sense of responsibility to entertain people. Ultimate entertainer, that's what he can do best. He is really a, a, a different guy. <laughs> well, we don't have a lot of plays. Only on plays we got to get the ball to me somehow. <laughs> <laughs> he used to get had that whole attitude, I don't give a damn, I'm challenging everyone in the building. Barkley, you really wanted someone to knock him down, knock him on his ass. And that was the joy of watching Barkley play. Sixers will set up for the final shot. AC Green and Charles Barkley. Charles with Rose. I never expected my career to skyrocket like it did. Went beyond my wildest, wildest expectation to level I achieved. Sir Charles and his 76ers would capture the Atlantic Division crown in 1990. Ah, when you're with it. Yes, sir. Yet for all the excitement he brought to Philadelphia, Barkley could never bring his team all the way to the finals during his eight seasons with the 76ers. In 1992, Charles Barkley was traded to Phoenix and found immediate success, winning the league MVP award while leading the Suns to the NBA Finals. Meanwhile, back in Philly, the Sixers were going through some lean years, but an answer was on the way. With the first pick in the 1996 NBA Draft, the Philadelphia 76ers select Allen Iverson from Georgetown University. And it was clear from the beginning that Allen Iverson was no ordinary rookie. It's time to get down. Iverson, this is going to be something with Stackhouse. He's slammed for two. But you are helpless when AI has it going on. That's Iverson. Yes! The kid has come up big. I knew that once I got an opportunity that I was going to showcase my God-given ability. I just felt like the sky was the limit. Iverson has Jordan. The crowd is into it. Allen shakes free. Gets two! The crowd loves it! 
It gives me great pleasure on behalf of the Philadelphia 76ers to present our rookie, Allen Iverson, with the Schick NBA Rookie of the Year Award. Yeah! <laughs> Despite Allen's individual accolades, the 76ers continued to struggle, winning just 22 games during his rookie season. At the same time, Iverson's controversial image continued to be scrutinized. And as the team headed into the following season, they were in search of a new direction. I feel great in introducing to you the head coach of the Philadelphia 76ers, Larry Brown. Yeah! At first, it was an odd couple, the old school coach and new age star. But gradually, Brown's influence began to take effect. It was his basketball genius that really decided to give Allen enough frame so he saw what he could do and what he would do. Rebound volleyball by Ori, but it's taken off over there by Davis. The wrap around pass behind the back, underneath, great play. Oh, what a play by Ivers. That's Allen Iverson at his best. I could see a change, a change for the better. I could see Allen inch by inch making progress. He once told me he wanted to have a relationship with me that the great athletes have with their coaches. With Iverson embracing Brown's team-oriented system, the Sixers assembled a cast of hard-working role players to complement their superstar. The chemistry was working, and Philadelphia was now winning. Hill got it to Stackhouse, and it's still the ball! McKee took it away! Sixers down two! Iverson for the top! In 1999, Allen led Philly to the playoffs for the first time in eight years, but he was just getting started. Two years later, Iverson captured the league MVP award and would carry his heroics into the playoffs with one of the greatest postseasons in NBA history. 52 points for Iverson. He is the man! Allen Iverson exploding here in game seven. Iverson runs down the floor, he puts his hand to his ear, he jumps with joy. He had an unbelievable 44-point performance here in Game 7. Reputations are made in the NBA playoffs, and Allen Iverson stamps his name in the annals of greatness. Allen had led the Sixers to their first Let's finals appearance in 18 years, and though they were huge underdogs to the Lakers, Iverson's will was large enough to stand up to any challenge. It's Allen Iverson and Shaq, truly a David and Goliath story. Specked off by Iverson, down the floor he goes against O'Neal, Allen by the big man, scoop by him, is good, a foot race, the tortoise and the hare. Here's Iverson, lose the defender, stays right with him, Allen wants to go, wants the baseline, he fires two balls. Got it again! He's way too good! He steps around Lou! Sixers shot the world with a game one victory here over the world champion Los Angeles Lakers. The irrepressible Allen Iverson. You cannot kill that guy. The 76ers would eventually lose in five games to a Laker team that was on its way to a dynasty. But this tenacious and resilient Sixers team had won the hearts of its fans and returned the franchise to prominence. This team taught me that, you know, you get a group of guys with character, you know, you can accomplish great things. Larry Brown stepped down as head coach after the 2003 season. One year later, a new coach arrived, Jim O'Brien, who was coming home to his native Philadelphia. And midway through the 2005 season, the Sixers made a bold move when they acquired all-star Chris Webber. He joined forces with the team's mainstay, Allen Iverson, to bring new hope to Philadelphia fans, a hope that the Sixers' future might be just as bright as their glorious past. In 1965, the Boston Celtics and Philadelphia 76ers inaugurated an Eastern Conference final rivalry in thrilling fashion. Here, putting the ball on play. He gets it out deep and Havlicek steals it over the stand two. Havlicek stole the ball. It's all over. It's all over. Jimmy Havlicek is being mobbed. In 1967, it was the 76ers' turn as they finally dethroned the Celtics in the Eastern Conference Final and went on to win their first championship. In 1968, Philadelphia built a 3-1 series lead 
but Boston became the first team ever to return from such a deficit when they took games five and seven in Philadelphia and moved on to reclaim their crown. It was deja vu for the 1981 Celtics. They found themselves in exactly the same hole that the Celtic team was in in the 1968 Eastern Conference Final, down three games to one. But the Celtics didn't intend to let this one get away either. Some last-second Larry Bird heroics had won game five, and now in game six, the 76ers couldn't believe their eyes as they let a 17-point lead slip away. Bird's seeing-eye jumper gave Boston a three-point margin and tied the series at three. We felt it really shocked him and really uh, tore him apart because now it's three to three and we're coming back to the garden. And that was just a game. Whoever had the most guts and the most determination was going to win that game. In the early going of game seven, it's Philadelphia who has the guts and determination as they forge an early lead. But Boston did not get to an Eastern Conference final without a little grit of their own. When Larry Bird converted this offensive rebound, the Celtics capped a third quarter spurt, outscoring the Sixers 10-2. The two teams battled back and forth through the final quarter. With less than three minutes remaining in the game, the score is tied, and it's nail-biting time in Boston. Daryl Dawkins has the ball down low. His shot is too strong. Larry Bird has the rebound. When the chips are down, he welcomes the pressure. Bird's bank shot has given Boston a precious one-point margin. The Sixers have just one chance left to save the series. But it was not to be, as Bobby Jones' desperation alley-oop was high, and the Celtics duplicated the feat of that Boston team 13 years earlier, returning incredibly from a 3-1 deficit against Philadelphia to win the Eastern Conference title. It was going to take another miracle in the 1982 Eastern Conference Finals because once again the Celtics trailed the Sixers three games to one. And once again the Celtics answered with a relentless fast break assault that let the Sixers know this series wasn't over yet. Could the improbable, the unthinkable happen again? By the middle of the third quarter, the game was over, and there was little doubt the Celtics had returned to form. The roars that filled the garden echoed last year's miracle, and Billy Cunningham was beginning to see the ghosts of the Celtics' past. Back in Philadelphia for game six, the Sixers jumped out quickly to a 15-point lead, and it looked as if they might finally rid themselves of those green ghosts. But 15 points can disappear in the blink of an eye in this league, and slowly but surely, momentum was shifting. Things started rolling the Celtics' way. Boston began pecking away at a dwindling Sixer lead. In the fourth quarter, Boston pounded out a 23-9 rebounding advantage. When Kevin McHale dropped in his 17th point with 7.58 remaining, the Celtics charged past the Sixers and into the lead. As far as the fans in Philadelphia were concerned, the game was over, and the series as well. In Philadelphia's eyes, the Sixers had let them down again. According to one Philadelphia newspaper, Boston need only mail in the score for Game 7. 
For the Celtics, this was a beautiful dream. And for one man, this was last year's nightmare. I'm so tired of hearing about last year, I can't tell you. Few people gave the Sixers a chance against the Celtics at home in Boston Garden. But from the beginning, the Sixers played tough, determined basketball. With poise and composure, they dominated the Celtics. And when Julius Irving swished this 20-footer, it became apparent that today, the Sixers were not going to be denied. With the Lakers waiting for the winner, something unique happened. From the Garden Rafters came a chant, beat LA, beat LA, an expression of support and confidence for a team that had felt so completely abandoned. In victory, Cunningham acknowledged the chant which had elevated this rivalry to an extraordinary level. That truly showed me a great deal of class. And as competitive as the two teams are, it truly made us feel good, and that's what it's all about, the competition. One of basketball's most intense competitors made his rookie debut in pursuit of an NBA World Championship. The Los Angeles Lakers' Magic Johnson. It's undescribable how much it really means to me, and uh, I would just like to have it, and um, I'm going to go get it. That's exactly what Magic did, as he and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar teamed up to bring the Lakers a victory in that first game against the Sixers. But Philadelphia, playing aggressive, hustling defense, came right back in game two to stop the Laker fast break. Bobby Jones found his spot with time running out, and his clutch basket preserved the Sixers' victory. The Sixers headed back to Philly with a split in the home court advantage. Magic Johnson erased that advantage immediately as he and Norm Nixon teamed up to give L.A. a victory in game three. Julius Irving's show-stopping aerial act kept Philadelphia just ahead of the Lakers in a close game four. But with seconds remaining, Los Angeles still had time for one mini miracle. But Bobby Jones, game two's hero, played free safety, and the series was even at two. The Lakers think they're the best, and the Sixers think they're the best in the NBA. And, you know, we have three games left to uh, find out who is the best. And, you know, pride is a major factor in this series. A victory now in Game 5 will put the winner just one win away from an NBA World Championship. And both these teams are prepared to make the necessary physical sacrifices. <laughs> This pivotal game was a hard-fought seesaw battle. Two of Kareem's game-high 40 points gives L.A. a two-point margin, but the big man sustains an ankle injury on the play. With four minutes remaining in the third quarter, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar is helped from the court. Late in the fourth, Kareem returns to the floor. His left ankle heavily taped. The score is tied at 103. There is less than a minute to play. Jabbar's three-point play wins it for the Lakers, but he pays the price. His ankle is severely sprained, and he does not make the trip to Philadelphia. Good job. Everybody's got to want it. 
We haven't shown it. They've wanted us, wanted more than The we Sixers have, have their back to the wall, but the Lakers are without their center. Rookie Magic Johnson lines up to take the center jump. Irvin Johnson's the name. And Magic is his game. Johnson double pumps his way to a 42-point night, and the Lakers can pop the champagne. Magic Johnson wins the MVP in his rookie season. In 1982, the Sixers and the Lakers were back again in the championship round. We have just one objective as a team, and that's to win a championship, and individual goals have put, been put to the side. The pregame spectrum is a pressurized launching pad, for this series promises to be explosive. Game one is a fast break battle, and the Lakers have the fastest fast break. In the third quarter, the Lakers tear off a 40 to nine scoring blitz, and the Sixers never recover. Cunningham must find a way to slow down the Lakers' awesome fast break. Game two, Cunningham's plan is simple. He must prevent the Lakers from playing the zone trap defense that triggers their break. A defense he thinks is illegal. By bringing his players outside, he forces L.A. to play his team man-to-man. -man. When the Lakers fail to match up, the zone becomes obvious. That's an illegal defense! After that, the Lakers play their trap defense. defense much less aggressively. And then in the fourth quarter, Julius Irving took control of the game as only he can do. Sparking the Sixers with six unanswered points. Philadelphia tied the series at one apiece, and the rivalry headed back to L.A. Game three was a battle of the boards, and Los Angeles had the best of it. Norm Nixon ran to a 21-point second half and the Lakers clinch game three easily. In game four, Kareem's 21 points and Jamal Wilkes 24 points helped put this Los Angeles team within one game of their second championship and the Sixers a game from elimination. Uh, we've been in this position the opposite way, being up 3-1 and uh, we know that um, you gotta win four games and we're looking forward to coming back to LA. If anyone thought Cunningham and the Sixers were making idle threats, Los Angeles found out differently, very quickly. The Sixers dealt the Lakers their worst playoff loss ever, a 33-point blowout. Philadelphia was very, very, very aggressive, and that was the difference in the game. Back at the Forum in Game 6, Dr. J leads Philadelphia on a 20-12 third quarter scoring streak to bring Philly one point from the lead, a lead they haven't enjoyed in three Forum appearances. This alley-ooper looks like a sure two points, but Bob McAdoo races the length of the court to make the block. McAdoo, born again in Los Angeles, had his best game of the series with 16 points and helped the Lakers win another crown. The Sixers' Billy Cunningham and Julius Irving would have to wait again until next year. 1983 delivered Philadelphia a savior who would lead them to the promised land, Moses Malone. Philadelphia destroyed opponents in the playoffs, and it looked as if 1983 might finally be the year that Sixer fans and Dr. J fans were hoping for that the Sixers might finally get Julius a ring. It's nice to hear somebody say, uh, you'd like to see Julius get a ring, or you Billy get a ring, or Moses get a ring. There's only one place you get it, it's on the court. There's no one the Sixers would rather have met on their court in the championship than the Lakers, and they set about their task with a vengeance, winning the first two at home.
you're playing against a team that's on a crusade, that's very talented and very committed. In game three at Los Angeles, Pat Riley called on Kareem to deal with Moses Malone. But Moses had his sights set on an NBA title, and there was no stopping the big man now. His 28 points and 19 rebounds gave Philadelphia its third victory. And the Sixers could sense the kill. We want to end it in four. We want someone to remember this team. There was no holding the Sixers back in game four. They were in a hurry to get to the promised land. And at last, they did. The dream was a reality. The Sixers were champions of the world. Finally, the Sixers had gotten the monkey off their back. At last, they could wash the bitter taste of defeat away with the sweet taste of champagne, of victory. One thing about this team that they should be remembered for is they had the ability every year to come back and just keep on doing it, and keep on doing it, and darn it, they climbed the mountain. Hospitalized for six weeks in the fall of 1964, Wilt is sluggish at the start of the season, and at the All-Star break, he is traded to an old rival, the former Syracuse team, now relocated in Philadelphia and renamed the 76ers. The 76ers, as far as I was concerned, were the old Syracuse Nationals, which was a team I hated. Despite his misgivings, Wilt will turn the Sixers into a contender, gaining confidence in the playoffs as they battle the Celtics in a memorable seven-game series. In the last seconds of Game 7, Wilt's dunk cuts the Celtic lead to one point. Then an unusual break sets up one of the NBA's unforgettable moments. Greer's putting the ball on play. He gets it out deep and a half attack. Two seasons later, the 76ers have built a team balanced and powerful enough to erase the pain of many past defeats. Wilt will be the foundation of what will prove to be a legendary team. It, it worked out well for me. It was one of the greatest things that ever happened because we end up uh, having, to me, the greatest basketball team that ever performed on the hardwood in the NBA. And of course, the guy who toured that team was Alex Hannum, who was uh, just a fiery competitor got the best out of the whole team. It was a powerful team. Physically, we were awesome as far as strength is concerned. And of course, that started with Wilt in the middle. You got this team and me in the center, and we've been together now for a couple of years. It just all really came together. I think our first 44 games, we were 41 and three. The key word there is chemistry. Each guy knew his job and made it happen well. We had the ultimate in a power forward in Luke Jackson. This was a guy who was as big and strong as anybody in the world with a touch as soft as you can possibly have. We had the greatest one-on-one -on -one player that I've had the pleasure of seeing in Chet Walker playing the other four. And now you go to the guard position and we start with a guy named Larry Costello who had a great two-hand set shot. And then Larry Costello got hurt and we brought in Wally Jones. And Wally Jones was just what we needed. Plus he shot some 40 foot falling down on your nose head uh, one-hander that we haven't figured out yet. Kyle Greer was a jump shooter like had no equal from medium range. He says jump shot from foul line when he shot fouls. Then you have something that had just started to become established in the NBA and that was the sixth man, and that was Billy Cunningham. 
and he came off the bench as a, a white boy from Brooklyn with five black guys. I mean, it was incredible. The 1967 Sixers achieved the best record in league history, 68 and 13, while the Celtics attempt to defend their unbelievable string of eight consecutive NBA titles. The 76ers never allow Boston a glimmer of hope. For the first time, Wilt's team has the talent and depth to demolish their rivals. The series is over in five games, ending with a runaway victory in Philadelphia. The season was very rewarding to me because we were so powerful and we, we just destroyed the Celtics who had, you know, had that decade all locked up. That was the year that, uh, that the fans got on the, uh, the thing of Boston is dead. It was unbelievable. It was uh, probably the, the most thrilling moment in, in my basketball career. Hannum's skillful blending of talents produces what many will call the greatest team in NBA history. As the Sixers savor the taste of triumph over the Celtics, they are only four victories away from the NBA crown. The relentless Sixers keep focused on their goal as they overwhelm San Francisco in six games. A new NBA champion is crowned for the first time since 1958. Swarmed by his euphoric teammates, Wilt no longer has to hear he can't win when it counts. He has proven to be the leader of perhaps the greatest team of all time. NBA showmen come in all shapes and sizes, and one of the biggest attractions was Daryl Dawkins. He was a blend of dominance and irreverence, a character who seemed almost from another galaxy. From the planet Lovetron, 6'11 center, Daryl Dawkins. I wanted to entertain people because people can go see basketball anywhere, but they see a different side of people when you try to entertain them. But early in his career, Daryl found himself waiting in the wings after being drafted out of high school by the Sixers. I'm sitting at the end of the bench, and I'm saying, boy, I gotta let these people know I'm in, the, I'm in here somewhere. So they put me in a game one night, and I got the ball, and I threw it in real hard. And they said, what's that? I said, it's called your mama. The next day, the fans got a hold of it. Your mama, they was coming. Hey, do the your mama dog. You do. I said, oh, man, I got a, I got a thing going here. And Darryl takes it right home. Oh. And that was awesome. Irving to Richardson, the advantage is to Philly, they give to Dawkins, oh, it's slamming! They'd like to see him underneath the basket with that ball. Look at that move! That's the best play I've seen this season. Fans were drawn to the power and personality of the man nicknamed Chocolate Thunder. Chocolate Thunder, uh, the rim record, a hard stopper. I was all of that, and a bag of chips. 6'11", 265 pounds, irrepressible, uh, witty charming at the same time, like a big teddy bear. Ladies and gentlemen, Daryl Dawkins. He is somebody that looks around him, sees what's there, drinks everything in, and is all about having fun. And nothing was more fun for Daryl than naming his ferocious slams. He had names that just, just come out of anywhere. I mean, he could be sleeping, he's talking about names. Here's Dawkins. Right hand is fine, Tiller Supreme. Look out! In your face, disgrace. Makes it nine to three bucks. <laughs> Mr. Dunn. Chocolate Thunder flying, glass flying, Robazine crying, babies crying, cats crying, rump roasting, bun toasting. Thank you, well, ma'am. I am Jane. Inside Dockin'. That was power personified. I uh, enjoyed entertaining the people. While I was doing my job, I just had a different way of doing it. I looked up to Julius Irving, Dr. J. Uh, I thought he was a, not only a great player, but also a wonderful human being. You know, growing up, uh, I really liked uh, Dr. J. I mean, the things he did on the court, especially above the rim as a kid, just made you keep your mouth open in awe.
1971, Julius Irving left the University of Massachusetts and signed on with the Virginia Squires of the ABA. He gave the new league a new identity and a dynamic young superstar. A player with that much ability and talent, I mean, in the ABA was just really astonishing to see. And there is Julius Irving. Look at that move behind the back. Oh! It wasn't Julius Irving, it was Dr. J, which meant when he got on the floor or on the court, he operated on God. Right down the lane, all the way, layup good! It probably was getting a glimpse of the game in the 90s and the 70s. So, you know, my game was probably a little bit ahead of its time. He was, in the ABA, the symbol of the league. Driving to the lane, up into the air, the shot looks good, it is! He wasn't just its biggest star, he was the league to those outside the ABA. He gave his team credibility. He gave the league credibility and an identity. And that sends everyone really. Julius Irving! In 1976, four teams from the ABA joined the NBA. And after three years with the Nets, Dr. J was acquired by the Philadelphia 76ers. I'm no longer a New York Net, I'm a Philadelphia 76er, and uh, you know, everyone else as well as myself might as well get used to it. The whole town was going crazy. We're getting a doctor, we're getting a doctor. All of Philadelphia was going crazy. Look, kids on the playground, even in church, they were talking about. When Doc came, that like almost knocked me off, you know, knocked me off my blocks. You got Doc, the doctor. Now, this is the playground legend. Without question, without any doubt, the absolute greatest forward that has ever thrown a pair of basketball shoes. From the University of Massachusetts, number six, captain of the Philadelphia 76ers, Julius the Doctor Irving. And Irving electrified the NBA with his aerial acrobatics and thunderous slam dunks. Crowds throughout the league were simply amazed watching a style they had never seen before. Fans were rooting for Dr. J, but rooting for their team. And as long as they saw the doctor perform and do something spectacular, they went home happy. He carry counts. We rock the baby to sleep and slam dunk. I think taking the ball to the hoop and, and dunking the basketball, particularly against bigger opponents, uh, was an expression of sorts. Look out. But for all of his signature dunks, it was a different kind of play that created his most unforgettable moment. In the 1980 finals against LA, Irving did the seemingly impossible, and even those who witnessed it still couldn't believe it. He had cut him off, and there was nowhere for him to go but out of bounds. So he jumped in the air, out of bounds. And he floated, and he spun it real high off the top of the glass. Julius Irving put it hanging underneath. He was trapped, and he still got the field goal. My mouth was like, and I looked at Coop. He looked at me, and I said to him, I said, Coop, you think we should uh, maybe ask him to do it again? <laughs> Throughout his career, Julius Irving stretched the game's creative limits and captured the attention of fans everywhere. But what made him so popular wasn't just his high-flying style of play, it was also his down-to-earth personality. Carrying himself with an air of grace and dignity, Irving became the ambassador for basketball in the 1970s. Julius not only had the, the great uh, skills, but he had a great aura of being a gentleman, of being a diplomat, of being, being you know, almost a saint. He had a personality, you know, and he had a, the kind of personality that would catch your eye. You know, I kind of learned the, the small things from Julius, and, you know, they, they, they wind up being big parts of my life, you know, keeping my humility and, and always thinking about somebody else. So I feel good to know the doctor. The 76ers of the late 70s were a star-studded team that seemed to have trouble meshing as a unit. I would say more than half of that team wanted to be the star or thought that they were the star. Uh, the egos were scary, and you can't win that way. After a disappointing loss in the 77 Finals, the Sixers began to search for a floor leader that could bring the team together. 
It would lead them to West Texas State University, which had embarked on a search of its own several years earlier. My assistant watched some, uh, a lot of Chicago public high school games, and uh, one of the top players was a guy by the name of William Dice. Uh, we asked him to visit, but he would not visit, uh, or said he wouldn't, unless he brought along his friend, which we didn't know anything about. His friend happened to be Maurice. Cheeks blossomed in West Texas State, earning all conference honors three years in a row. After being selected by Philadelphia in the second round of the 78 draft, many wondered how his quiet demeanor would blend in with the team's boisterous personalities. I remember most Maurice Cheeks first came into the league. Matter of fact, I let him stay at my house a few times. Maurice Cheeks had a afro so big you couldn't get it all in the picture. And Henry Pippi used to tease him all the time because he didn't have a jump shot. I came to camp and I was actually waiting on someone to tell me I was cut because we just had a lot of big name guys at the time and I just never really thought I had a chance. Not only did Cheeks make the team, he was named the starting point guard. And his team-oriented style soon began to rub off on the Sixers, transforming the team into a more unselfish unit. Great pass like to Cheeks. Once we got Maurice Cheeks, that was uh, an absolute freedom you know, for me because he looked to pass first rather than shoot first. Here's a two-on-two two break. Cheeks, Julius. And Cheeks created it all. He made his decisions before guys were open. The ball was already in the air before the guy came off the pick, so when he was open, the ball got into his hands before the defensive man had time to recover. And very few ball players have that knack. Bring it down into the corner. Force the defense to do something. Well, every coach needs a, an extension on the floor, and Mo was exactly that for Billy Cunningham. He was intuitive about the game. He had a, a real high level of understanding. I remember as a young reporter telling my son, if you want to learn the game, watch Maurice Cheeks. You can enjoy Dr. J. You can't do what he does. You can learn to do the things that Maurice does. You can learn to do the basics. Oh, what a beautiful pass by Mo Cheeks. With Cheeks in charge, the Sixers returned to the NBA Finals three times in four years in the early 80s. And in 1983, they steamrolled through the playoffs with a 12-1 record, culminating with their crowning achievement, a four-game sweep of the Lakers. The Philadelphia 76ers, Maurice Cheeks, quiet, no, they're going to be the one yeah. champions, folks. We had a great team. I mean, Moses, Doc, Andrew, Tony, Bobby Jones. We had a great nucleus for winning that championship. What I thought was intriguing for all the leadership qualities he possessed, he was silent about it. Uh, he, he was not a rah-rah guy. Uh, he was all about getting everybody involved in the offense and then biting you at the right time. And there's a steal by Cheek. Cheeks didn't just orchestrate the Sixers' offense, he was crafty and calculating on defense as well, making the NBA's all-defensive team four times. Terry doing what he does best, picking someone's pocket. My rookie year, I remember the first time I played against Morris, and I remember watching him, I used to say, oh, he's not that great of a defensive player. And the first two quarters, it seemed like he was almost letting me bring the ball up, but he was getting closer, and he was intensifying the pressure each quarter. Then by the third quarter, he was everywhere I was at, he was at. In the fourth quarter, I thought he was inside of me. And a steal by Cheeks. Don't keep your eye away from Maurice Cheeks. That's the moral. At the crunch time of the game, he always seemed to be able to come up with the definitive defensive play to turn the game. He almost came to expect it uh, on a nightly basis. Intercepted by Cheeks. Jaminski back. Cheeks dunks it. But after consistently being title contenders, the Sixers began to fade in the late 80s, falling victim to age and injuries. One by one, their stars departed, and in 1989, it was Moe's turn as he was traded to San Antonio. It was pretty much a shock. I, you know, it's something, nah, it's just, it's just like bad news, man, you know, I don't... <laughs> But as a consummate professional, he set aside his disappointment and devoted himself to being a mentor to younger players. I can remember him coming to the Nets 
uh, to sort of advise others. And, and that's the respect I think everybody in the league had for him. As a coach, Maurice has tried to instill some of the values he displayed in his career as a 76er. I knew the game and I knew I could teach part of the game to other people and other players and that's what I wanted to do. Moses Malone was basketball's blue collar superstar, a player whose talent was matched by his tenacity. He enjoyed his best seasons with the Rockets and 76ers while becoming one of the 50 greatest players in NBA history. For Moses, it all began on the playgrounds of Petersburg, Virginia, and it soon became apparent that this young player was something special. My first sight of Moses Malone goes back to the five-star basketball camp. Now, Howie Garfinkel is the greatest evaluator of talent at the high school level that I've ever seen. His statement about Moses Malone, he's the only player in 36 years that was too good for the camp. In 1974, Moses became one of the first players to go from high school to the pros when he was drafted by the ABA's Utah Stars. I was at his press conference in New York City when he, when he became a high school player, declaring he was skinny. And I mean really skinny. A guy you'd look at and you'd say, you know, no way, it's not going to happen. When we signed him, I knew that he had great talent. I had no idea that he would be doing the things that he's doing right now. He could be maybe the best offensive rebounder in the history of the game. He's very good at it now, and I'm sure in a year or two, when he's old enough to shave, he'll be excellent. Moses did go on to achieve excellence in the NBA, and he specialized in the art of rebounding. Attacking a glass with fierce determination, Malone would set the standard for offensive rebounds. He is a three-time MVP. Well, everybody knows that. But he is the leading offensive rebounder by over 2,000 rebounds. Number one. Oh, had to work hard. Still can't get the ball to drop. Here he goes again. And he still can't. Malone pushes it in. If you didn't absolutely face guard him, there was no chance. If you turned your head, you were going to lose sight of him, and he was going to get the offensive rebound. Uh, Moses was relentless. I know we throw words around like relentless and hard work, but that really doesn't do it justice. By the time you finish your pregame talk, Moses was already in sweat. <laughs> he, was, he was ready to go. I mean, I, I've never had a, a teammate who worked harder in the game and in practice. As great a player as he was, Moses often preferred to let his game speak for itself. With his stoic presence and quiet demeanor, he was sometimes perceived as being distant. But those who knew him best knew that was anything but the truth. He is the funniest guy. You know, Moses wasn't a media guy. He wasn't like a social guy as far as uh, talking to people all the time. But to the team and his good friend, man, he is one of the funniest people you will ever meet. Arriving in Philadelphia in 1982, Moses was seen as the missing link to a championship. He predicted the Sixers would sweep all three playoff series, and they nearly did, going 12-1 to capture the title. Not steal the ball. There it goes. Cheeks on his way to the World Championship to Moses. Slam dunk. How's it feel to get him in four straight, though? Oh, man. That's the best. <laughs> Despite Barkley's questionable reputation and his recurring weight problems, the Philadelphia 76ers made him the fifth pick in the 1984 draft. And as he began his rookie season, Charles quickly displayed the ability that had caught the Sixers' attention. It was just his amazing strength and explosiveness, even at that time weighing around 280 pounds. And you'd say to yourself, wow, this guy could be, you know, something special. But though Charles played with raw passion, he seemed unable or unwilling to discipline his talent. Charles' first year was quite an experience. Charles would um, act up. Charles wouldn't run back to half court. Charles, Charles was very difficult, to say the least. It seemed as if Charles had once again fallen into the rebellious trap that he had struggled through at Auburn, but now, he would have veteran center Moses Malone, one of the NBA's hardest workers, to provide him with an example. You, you could see that Charles wanted to be great, but he didn't want to work at it. 
starts to charge. You know, things you got to do, it's not going to come easy because right now you're into pro ball, you got a lot of great athletes. Uh, so what you got to do, get the attitude and get mean and get aggressive and come play every night. Under Moses' tutelage, Charles learned to tap his vast well of natural ability. Up until then, I had never worked hard. I just played the game strictly on talent. He taught me how to work hard. I got in really good shape, and I'm just uh, watching him and learning from him. As he began his second season, Barkley saw Moses' lessons begin to pay off. The line, Barkley's there, gets it again. Reverse left hand by Barkley. Here's a bad pass. It might get out of hand. Oh. Not before Charles gets it. Pink, uh, it's just a question of Charles wanting it more than Dan Roundfield. He got believing in himself and got believing in what he could do. And he just, he went to another level. Just as Barkley was beginning to mature as a player, however, he would be thrust into a demanding new role. At the age of 24, the mantle of responsibility had fallen on him. Doc was gone, Moses was gone, uh, Bobby Jones was gone, and, and it was uh, Charles Barkley's team. It was a challenge that stoked Barkley's competitive fire. Responding with a vengeance, he would take his game to another level and take the league by storm. Charles just taking over now. Oh, oh what a pass! Oh, that's the pass of the year. That's the finish. Gotta finish. Oh, what a rejection by Barkley! What a play! What a play! Comes Charles down the lane. Goodbye. Physical. The guy's just relentless. So here's Barkley now, going to go in by himself. Gets the offensive rebound and spins it. I, I think he intimidates everyone. Barkley, the move, and a foul. They're, you know, he's just unstoppable. Ball taps it once and can't make it. Charles looks like he's just determined to take over this game. About as authoritatively as you can, he went through. Whoops. The sucker play by Barkley. Does it work? Yes. <laughs> Charles was now dominating opponents and doing it in an entirely new way. Charles is on the run again. Two on two. Behind his wow. right by Ellis Hole. Here you had a power forward in a small forward's body uh, with guard instincts, and uh, there's never been a player that I can remember that combined all of that. He's bringing the house down. Barkley had become one of the league's marquee stars, and no one was enjoying it more than Charles himself. Charles is a fun-loving guy, and uh, a big part of his success, I would say, is fueled by, by emotion. That's what I'm talking about, That's the ultimate entertainer. Him. That's what he can do best. He is really a, a, a different guy. His elevator doesn't always go to the top. Both on and off the court, Charles was now the center of attention. Me. Charles is going to get the first high cat. This is called Yay, Alabama. Go roll to victory, hit your stride, your dick is with my pride, Chris, and time. <laughs> Charles, at heart, is an entertainer. Uh, he, he enjoys being in the limelight. He enjoys being a celebrity. Comedy winds up in the cheerleading section, and uh, Barkley, too, he doesn't want to get up. <laughs> <laughs> He's an intelligent man. And whether he was playing to fans or reporters, he rarely disappointed. What's the most important thing you have to do next game? Score more points than they do. <laughs> All you have to do is ask Charles Barkley a question, kickstart him, and he's on his way, and he's honest. Well, we don't have a lot of plays. Only, only plays we got is get the ball to me somehow. <laughs> With his no-holds-barred approach to celebrity, Charles had become one of the most distinctive superstars in all of sports and had achieved a level of fame that even he never dreamed of. But with all of his accomplishments, there was still something missing. Since taking over the team's reins, he had been unable to find postseason success. It was a void that had begun to take its toll. Charles cares. Uh, despite all of that um, outward bravado and all the uh, charisma that flows out of Charles, within is, a, is an intense athlete who cares, who has pride, who wants to be successful. And as the 1990 season began, it was clear that Charles was more determined than ever to bring playoff glory to Philadelphia. You know, he wanted the game on his shoulders. He, he, unlike some other players that you know that aren't comfortable with the chips on the line and the gun staring you know at them, I mean, he thrives on that. Seven seconds left. Charles is going to drive from there. Little 18-footer. Go! Oh, there you go. <laughs> what a play! 
You know, there were games when he needed to stop people and play good defense. He did. Dominique Wilkins to the other end. Spin move, scoop shot, offensive foul. Philadelphia has the lead on the ball with three seconds left. But as important as his personal heroics was his ability to instill the team with his own spirit. His desire to win made me get it and then we started having a lot of fun winning and then in turn winning you just you act like a kid you have a good time so he finished that baby or what and charles just in ecstasy Barkley, one two three triple bogey and the foot stop ah oh, when you're winning yes sir feeding off barkley the sixers ran roughshod over the lead and enjoyed doing it piling up 53 wins and capturing the team's first Atlantic Division title in seven years, they surged through the season on an emotional high. Sixers will set up for the final shot. A.C. Green and Charles Barkley. Charles with room. Yes, score it. Score it and a foul. And as they entered the postseason, Barkley's sights were set on nothing less than a march to the finals. He felt at that time that that was the most talented team that he had around him and this was his chance to uh, in Philly to, to get there. In the first round, the Sixers began their playoff quest in style. Three on two. As Barkley led them past the talented Cleveland Cavaliers. Here goes Charles. Great play. This team is too good to worry about one series. We, I mean, we, we going, we're going to Chicago feeling like we can win. Confidently heading into the second round, Barkley and the Sixers looked forward to facing another up-and-coming young team. A victory against Michael Jordan's Chicago Bulls seemed like it would be the perfect stepping stone to establishing the Sixers' supremacy in the East. But it was not to be. Ambushed by a Chicago team that seemed suddenly to be coming into its own, the Sixers would manage to win only a single game. Takes it all the way to the rack. Oh! Barkley's high hopes had been dashed, and Charles himself was left all but brokenhearted. I'm disappointed and frustrated right now. I mean, I, I can't even put it into words how bad I feel right now. I mean, it's that bad. You know, most of the people out there, they don't understand. They think it's just a game you play. This is uh, your job, and you really, you really care about winning and losing. Chicago would go on to win a championship the very next year, but Philadelphia would never recover. Injuries and ill-fated trades would disband the group of players that had achieved such special chemistry, and Barkley could only watch in frustration. Part of what makes Allen Iverson such an exciting player to watch is his explosiveness on the court. At any moment, he can go off. Iverson now with eight steals. Make it nine. nine. It's a playoff record. Cruises and solos for two. Allen Iverson, a playoff record, nine steals. Oh, my, I take that. I mean, he's, he's a gift, man. He's a gift from God. He's a freak of nature. Imagine some of Michael Jordan's best moves. Now, speed it up a little. Put that 45 on a 33 RPM. Boom. I mean, that's Allen Iverson. Iverson accelerates, putting the speed on. He doesn't move like anything we know. It, it's quicker. Backdoor pass, Iverson, oh. twisting shot, and it counts. Iverson takes on all comers, count it, and a foul. Iverson moving against Ryder, loses Ryder, comes in deep. Following a footer, good. What a show. He may stand just six feet tall, but Allen Iverson's impact on the court is enormous. He's the, the little version of Shaquille O'Neal, because you can't stop Shaq and you can't stop Iverson. Let's see what Anthony does. Forget about it. Iverson for two. Iverson crosses over against Brown, gets two, and they ooh and ah here. I don't think there's one player, one defender, that will stop Allen Iverson. Allen Iverson has scored the Sixers' last 19 straight points. Yes! He is the man! Allen plays with an unrelenting passion, blending toughness, drive, and determination. But those who wonder where those qualities come from will find there is another answer besides Allen himself. Iverson for the lead! 
Allen has been shaped as both a player and a person by his mother, Anne, who has always been by his side as the guiding force throughout his life. I love you with so much heart. I'm going to pass it on to you, baby. It's going to be wrong. Right, go ahead. You know, I remember one time we went on an AAU tournament when I was 13, and um, we didn't have no lights on in the house because she spent the, um, the money for the light bill on my sneakers. I always looked up to my mom, like she was the one that told me I could be anything that I wanted to be. You know, I believed it. And Allen would carry that confidence into his first NBA season. It's time to get down. Iverson, this is going to be something with Stackhouse. He's fired for two. You are helpless when AI has it going on. Yes. Iverson, yes! The kid is from a big, brings his crowd into a frenzy. For Iverson, the 1997 season would turn into one long highlight reel. He would capture the league's Rookie of the Year award while also making NBA history along the way. Yes, and there it is! Allen Iverson, four straight with 40 or more, breaking the Wilt Chamberlain standard that had stood for 37 years. Simply, simply amazing. What a week. Yet despite his personal accomplishments during his rookie season, there were those who had labeled Iverson as a selfish player, and his image would take a beating. It was probably best summed up by Charles Barkley, who said, it's me, myself, and Iverson. And that's the way he was perceived, and, and not necessarily wrongly so. Allen would also provide ammunition for critics who claimed he hadn't shown enough respect for the game's legends. He challenged Michael Jordan to the effect, in the first game they played, he said, I'm not afraid of Michael Jordan, I can play anybody. And in effect, it was interpreted as how dare he challenge Michael Jordan. Iverson has Jordan, the crowd is into it. Allen shakes free, gets two! You know, I don't want to be Michael Jordan, I don't want to be Magic, I don't want to be Bird or Isaiah, I don't want to be any of those guys. You know, when my career is over, I'm going to look in the mirror and say I did it my way. And Iverson's way would make him the personification of the brash hip-hop superstar. For Allen, it was simple. He was merely being true to himself, no matter what the rest of the world may have thought of him. People think because he has cornrows, and might be because he's black and from the hood, that he's bad. I don't wear a suit before and after a game, and I don't, I'm not clean cut, and, and I get knocked for that. So all of a sudden, I cut all my hair off and wear suits. Are you gonna love me then? I'm still gonna be the same person. After the Sixers won just 22 games in Allen's first season, the team turned to a new leader, veteran coach Larry Brown. And from the start, the old school coach was on a collision course with a player used to doing things his way. It's mind boggling to me when your team is not the most important thing. And he's doubled, hacked, fouled, <laughs> driven <laughs> ground, takes another bruise. He's, I'm telling you, the little guy, he is something. Despite their differences, Larry Brown couldn't help but be intrigued by his star, not only because of his obvious talent, but also the incredible intensity with which he played. I always play with my heart. You know, I play with my heart first. And I owe that to my teammates. I owe it to myself, the fans in Philadelphia, my coaching staff. And they're on their feet. This house is rocking. Rebound volleyball by Ori, but it's taken off over there by Davis. The wraparound pass behind the back. Underneath, great play. What a play by Iverson. That's Allen Iverson at his pitch. Gradually, Brown got Iverson to accept his team-oriented concept, and their partnership would flourish in the 2001 season, with Allen surrounded by a cast of hard-working role players. The 76ers raced out to the NBA's best record. Iverson in the lane. Up and good! What a driving layup by Allen Iverson! AI sees all and hits all! Finally, it seemed that Larry Brown and Allen Iverson had put their conflict behind them. And the ultimate proof that things had changed came in the 2001 All-Star Game when Iverson was voted the most valuable player. Iverson down the lane, scooped it in! Who my coach? Coach Brown. Is he around? This is, this is, you know, this is a tribute to Coach Brown. The thing that I'm proud of him is learning how to play. And he was a kid that was so competitive, wanted to play one against five every possession. And I just see his game developing. And he wants to win so badly. He's such an unbelievable competitor. 
and I'm learning a lot about him. Here's Allen for the tie! Yes! Yeah! Allen would lead the Sixers to the Eastern Conference Finals. Allen Iverson exploding here in Game 7. With his brilliant play in this critical game, Iverson would put to rest any remaining questions about his leadership as he carried his team to the NBA Finals. Iverson runs down the floor. He puts his hand to his ear. He jumps with joy. He had an unbelievable 44-point performance here in Game 7. Reputations are made in the NBA playoffs, and Allen Iverson stamps his name in the annals of greatness. The 76ers are the Eastern Conference champions, and they're going to Tinsel Time. Hey, yo, man. Y'all boys ain't no joke, man. I love y'all, man. I love y'all. Hey yo, that's a, that's a team, man. That's a team right there, baby. It's Allen Iverson and Shaq. Truly a David and Goliath story. But the first blow would be struck by David in the form of Allen Iverson, as he would lead the underdog Sixers to victory in game one against the Lakers. Here's Iverson. Lou the defender. Stays right with him. Allen wants to go. Wants the baseline. He fires two balls. Got it again! He steps around Lou and drilled it. He's way too good. And though Philadelphia would lose the series, the league's MVP won new respect from fans everywhere with his valiant performance against all odds. Is the little fella tough or what? Gets cracked and still gets it in. Though the Sixers remained contenders, Larry Brown would depart Philadelphia following the 2003 season. The long-running soap opera between coach and player was now over, but Allen Iverson would add new chapters to his phenomenal career with more playoff heroics. Backs up three ball on his way, he got it! Oh yeah, you gotta believe he knocked out a three and the crowd is going nuts again. And Allen Iverson raises his hands to the top of the first Union Center and then palms his left ear and says, let me hear you. All that matters is you go out and play every game like it's your last. Then after the game's over, you can look in the mirror and say, I did all that I could. And now, you know, that's enough. I don't think anybody really understood how tough a guy Allen Iverson is. He is so tough. I don't know how much he weighs, but it's all guts. All guts and heart. You could not deter him from taking the ball to the basket. You could knock him down 10 times in a row. The 11th time, he's still going to go there. And that may be Allen's greatest legacy, because throughout his career and his life, nothing has been able to keep him down. One of the game's smallest players has battled huge obstacles, and through it all, he has remained the foundation in Philadelphia. And Allen's shot is up and good again. He is single-handedly carrying these Sixers. 